this is a great crowd tonight. Thank you all for coming out. And we're noticing that uh, you all realize that there's limited seating here and there's going to be a good thing happening very soon. So uh, good to see you coming downtown. Matt Peoples has been down in Tucson for a couple years now. He was working on a, a really incredible grant program, which I think sometime uh, we'll be bringing him back yet again to talk about uh, the Southwest Social Networks Project. His dissertation work uh, from ASU uh, on the Zuni area uh, is uh, a part of what he's going to be reporting on tonight. And Matt is a young guy, and I'm always amazed by the depth of his experience and his ability to uh, share his enthusiasm with an audience. So without further ado, Matt Peoples talking about cooking pots and culture in the Zuni region. Matt? Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay with the microphone? So, uh, you know, these archaeology cafes are great, but one of the things that's a little bit intimidating about this uh, format is the lack of slides and visuals, because I really love having maps and pictures and stuff like that. So I cheated as much as possible. I've got these handouts and a couple of color handouts on your, on your table, and it's got a front and back side with a page one and page two, and I'll refer to those a couple times. And also I brought some additional... Uh, sort of visuals. I've got this box here. This contains a bunch of cooking pottery, fragments of cooking pottery from the Cibola region. And I'm going to slowly, you know, you can pass this from table to table. I'd ask you not try to jostle it too much. And it has got a glass lid, so it's a little bit heavy. But, you know, take a look at this. And this gives you an idea of some of the variation of pottery and the, the surface treatments of pottery. And, you know, just to give you an idea of how variable this can be, these are all from a single site. So all from a single site. And you can still see just how much variation there really is. So I'll start right here. Thank you. And if that's too hard to pass around, we can just let people look at it at the end. And the other thing I've got, which I think uh, Kathleen's going to help me with a little bit here, and, and Kate, I've got, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about some experimental <laughs> ceramic production. Because clay can be a little bit messy, <laughs> we're going to use Play-Doh. And we're actually going give to you, give you guys some so you can, you can play with that a little bit and uh, pass that around. So the, yeah, everybody have a lump. And, no, every, you know, feel free to play along and, you know, get in touch with your inner, inner kindergartner tonight. <clears throat> but so, so, so the research I'm talking about tonight is, is in what's called the Cibola region, sometimes the Zuni Cibola region. And you look in the maps that I gave you on page one, in the, the top left corner, you can see this sort of dotted outlined area. And you guys are going to have to share a little bit. And that dotted outlined area right in the center along western uh, New Mexico and eastern Arizona, right, right in the middle of the southwest, as I have it on here, uh, is, is, is known by archaeologists as the Cibola region. And I've drawn this as sort of as big as any archaeologist might draw this, this region. And this area is marked by a uh, common suite of decorated painted ceramic types. So people throughout this region are using sort of a similar um, variety of painted ceramics, which is known as Cibola whiteware. Um, there's other broader similarities in settlement patterns and um, as well as environmental conditions. Yeah, you can pass around the little vessel too. And uh, so archaeologists kind of treat this as a unit of analysis, a division uh, across the region. But at the same time, you can see on this map, I also have these broader regions that referred to as Anasazi, Ancestral Pueblo, and, and Mugion, and the, those, those cross-cut that Cibola region. So you can see at one level, archaeologists treat the Cibola region as a unit. But at another scale, at a broader scale, these broad uh, cultural and material cultural similarities that we see as archaeologists actually cross cut. So it really gives you an idea of how complex uh, the patterns are of, of interaction and, and, and social identity across this region at the time. And the time period that my research is focused on is, is what's, what's called the Pueblo III and Pueblo IV periods. And, the period I'm basically looking at goes from about AD 1150 to about uh, 1325. So that's about the time period of, for everything that I'm talking about today. And the Pueblo III to Pueblo IV transition in this region occurs around 1275. So that's sort of the break point between the two. And this is a, what we call the Pueblo III to Pueblo IV transition seems pretty innocuous when you talk about it in those terms. But what it was is a really, really rapid and massive social change that characterized a huge area um, Across, uh, across the Cibola region. And some of the changes involved where there was massive population movement. So people are moving across vast distances. 
they're consolidating, populations consolidating into clusters of habitation. So whereas people had been kind of spread across the landscape, they're consolidating into, into groups uh, that have empty spaces in between them. So there's, there's sort of, at, at a landscape scale, people are moving around a lot. Uh, the other ma major thing is that people are really reconfiguring the way that they're living, the kinds of structures they're living in. And for example, if you see on page two, I have a couple of site plan maps here. Um, what's labeled as Scribe S there would be sort of a typical Pueblo three community from the uh, Eastern Zuni region at this time. So you can see every one of those little black blobs in the map is a room block that, you know, is a little Pueblo that may have housed one or a few related families, you know, so every one of those is a few, a few people living together and they have lots of neighbors relatively nearby and there'd be other communities, clusters like this, you know, maybe a few miles away. So they've got lots of neighbors, but they're sort of living in their own structures that they're building themselves, even, even when they might be clustered. After the beginning of the Pueblo IV period, that changes completely and, and in a very small uh, amount of time in this region. And then Pueblo IV sites are more typically what these, these ones labeled Pueblo de los Muertos and uh, the Lower Derecho Ruin shown on here. And those are, you know, you can almost think of them as massive apartment blocks. These things are often four stories, you know, so multiple stories, very, very tall walls built around these open plazas. And in the Zuni region in particular, they're often in these characteristic square or circle shapes. So the, and, and actually the earliest ones are combinations of circles and squares. So there's some interesting patterns going on there. But, you know, just to kind of put this in human terms, I like to say, you know, if, if you were born about 1260 in western, west central New Mexico, you know, you probably would have lived with your family, maybe a few, like, extended relatives in a relatively small little Pueblo, little hamlet out on the landscape. You would have had neighbors around you, but they would have been, you know, a stone's throw away or maybe further away. But by the time you're about 20 years old, you're almost certainly living in one of these massive compounds and you know you have maybe a thousand neighbors living cheek to jowl so like you can imagine how big a transition that is you know you think about rural to urban migration and things like that but in this case there's not even really a precedent for that so people didn't even really know what it was to be living in these massive communities like that because this is sort of unique to the area at this time so you know we talk about a Pueblo 3 to Pueblo 4 transition that seems like you know it's just one archaeological phase to the next but really this is a massive social change that's happening at this time so keep that in mind, that's the context of everything I'm talking about tonight. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about specifically the relationship between cooking pots and what cooking pots and storage pots can tell us about uh, cultural relationships, social relationships and interactions across this transition that I just described. So, you know, studying things like cooking, storage and food are, are, are good ways to look at culture because food and food ways are some of the most distinctive and sort of and often conservative aspects of culture. Uh, you can think of regional cuisines and things like that and those are often something that maintains, if, if you think of immigrant communities in the United States, often their, their food ways and cuisine are things that are retained for many, many generations and even as maybe the foods that they have access to change, the tools that they use to produce them, the techniques uh, and sort of the ways they cook often are quite conservative over long periods of time. And, there's been a lot of cross-cultural work that shows that this is a strong pattern across many, many, many parts of the world where food is really strongly tied to cultural identity. And what I'm talking about today is some of my research in the Zuni Cibola region. So the larger region is called the Cibola region and it's centered on the Zuni Indian Reservation in western New Mexico. So we, you can hear me refer to it as the Zuni Cibola region. Um, it's, it's often thought of as areas that were ancestral to contemporary Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. And the research I'm going to be talking about today is focused on uh, these unpainted, what we sometimes call utilitarian ceramic vessels. So these, these are vessels that are not painted. They're used, you know, throughout the food system for cooking food, for storing food, for serving food. So th these are all sort of tied up and, and eating and cooking. So that, that's sort of the context of what I'm talking about. And what I argue in my research is that if we, if we see similarities and differences in the way people make use and consume these, these ceramic vessels, we, we can tell something about, you know, similarities and differences in, in culture between different parts of this region. So that, that was sort of the impetus of what I was looking at here. And archaeologists often refer to these kinds of differences in, in these sort of everyday objects like this as technological style is a, is, is a word you'll see quite a bit. And this idea, you know, based on a lot of cross-cultural research across the region, is that attributes of material culture that are either invisible or you know a very low of visibility in the final product 
are often uh, you know, taught and learned through motor habits, like the way your hand is held, held when you're making a vessel or you know, how you build a hearth in your, in your own home or something like that. That's not public and out in the open. It's, it's much more private. Those sorts of things tend to vary uh, in relation to how much interaction people have uh, among each other and if they have historical connections. So if you see similarities in a lot of these sort of low visibility or invisible kinds of technological styles, that, that may suggest that people have strong historical relationships with each other or they may be interacting on a regular basis. And when you see strong differences, that can suggest the opposite, that there may be some you know, very broad cultural differences uh, between these groups. So in general, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, cooking pottery in the region. And basically, I'm arguing that we see similarities or differences across the region that can tell us something about general practices related to cooking, serving, storage, uh, and eating that are all important aspects of culture. So um, for a number of reasons, utilitarian cooking pots in the Cibola region and the Southwest in general are great for, for this kind of study. Um, first of all, they're overwhelmingly locally produced. So, you know, you, you hear all these things about pottery moving quite some distances across the Southwest, and there's a lot of chemical characterization studies that have shown this, that pottery does sometimes move hundreds of kilometers across the region. These cooking pots don't tend to move as frequently or as far. So in a sample that I looked at in this region, in, in the Cibola region, uh, I found that about 90% of vessels were found in the place where they were likely produced. So about 90% of the time, people are using and consuming these cooking pots right basically where they're made. And you know, a, a petrograph, petrographic or a compositional source may be an area that's sort of 10 or 15 kilometers across. So you can think of you know, like one or a couple of river valleys near each other. These things are mostly staying within these, these areas. And um, when they do move, so uh, the, that 10% that does move, three quarters of those are found in the adjacent area. So, so these things are really, really local. You know, this, this is, if, if we're looking at aspects of technology of these, these planeware pots in this region, what we're really looking at is the technological decisions and practices of local potters. So that's, that's one reason why these are great for this kind of study. Uh, the second reason is an aspect of the way they're made in the Southwest throughout most, most, of, the, most of the Northern Southwest for, for a very long period of time. They're produced uh, through what's called, and they're called corrugated pottery. So what this means is that um, the pots are formed, you know, and this is why I have everybody pass it, pass it all the Play-Doh. I don't know if there's a little chunk somewhere that I can have. <laughs> but yeah, you want to toss me that? Thank you. But these are, these are produced through, you know, making the little snake of clay, like you all did in elementary school back in, back in kindergarten. You know, and this, this isn't a perfect analog for clay because it's not quite as sticky and stuff, so it can be a little bit difficult to work with. But basically what a potter does to make a corrugated vessel, and for a lot of other vessels as well, is you, you produce a coil like this and start spiraling from the bottom. And I'm going to make a very small, the world's smallest corrugated pot I'm making here. So I'm making sort of a little cone here. And you can see you have this sort of spiral that starts from the bottom. And uh, you know, you, you can all kind of experiment and play with this on your own. But the interesting thing about this is, is a lot of pottery traditions in different parts of the world and even at different times and places in the Southwest, the next thing they'll do is they'll smooth over all these coils on the outside and sort of obliterate you know, any of that, any of the spaces between the coils and you'll end up something with it that's relatively smooth. You know? And that, that might be the finished product you're looking for. But one of the great things about cooking pottery in the Zuni Siebler region and a lot of other parts of the Southwest is they never, they never completely obliterate those coils. They leave them exposed. And because of that, we can actually tell quite a bit about the way they're being made because they, they don't sort of wipe away all that evidence of all the early production steps in their production. And you know, in, in my own research, a big part of what I was trying to do was identify things that were distinctive to different areas of this region and you know, different techniques that were distinctive. So it's convenient you know, that they're, they're leaving us this evidence directly in the ceramic, ceramic vessel walls. But you know you have to do a lot of experimental work to kind of figure out what these were, and I'm a terrible potter, you know. So I, I, tr I tried my absolute best, and I made lots and lots and lots of vessels, most of which I'll never show to anyone. I won't even show them to my wife for the most part because I'm just embarrassed of these. But you know I did I did learn a lot in the process, but it's it's not the same as as working with or being an expert potter. And I was lucky enough to uh, in 2009 head out to the Loop Kiln Conference that was in Snowflake that year. 
And uh, the photos that you see on the corner, the bottom corner of page one there, are John Olson, uh, National Park Service, making corrugated pottery. And you know, he's, he's an amazing potter, and he can just do this entirely fluently. You know, make an entire vessel in 20 minutes, and it's beautiful. It'd be fired, yeah, and, and you, it would get lost in most archaeological collections if he didn't sign them, you know. So this is, this, this is an incredible thing. He, he, he really does have a skill for it. And some of the things I learned through this, you know, is you often, as you, as you see these things being passed around, uh, the sherds, and you, you can kind of mess with this on your own, there's all these little indentations in the coils and things like that. And, you know, my assumption and a lot of other people's assumption is, you know, it would be someone that has to have very small fingers, or, you know, to kind of make those indentations like that. And, you know, John has hands kind of like mine, you know, like not particularly small fingers, and he, he could make those really fine indentations. So it's all about technique. It's not really about sort of, you know, the physical differences between people and things like that. And the interesting thing about this is, you know, going to the Luke Kiln Conference, he builds up this vessel in about 20 minutes. It's just absolutely beautiful. I'm taking photos the whole time. These are some of them. I think it's amazing. You know, he kind of looks at it, doesn't like the look out of it, and he, he smashes it up and puts it back in his Tupperware to take the clay home with him, you know. And I was just sort of heartbroken because it's like, <laughs> I've, I've been trying to do this. I've been trying to do this for months with with little to no success. So it, you know, skilled potters really can make a difference. And um, there's been a lot of talk in the Southwest about why people did this. Why did they leave these coils exposed on vessels? And, and there's a lot of sort of different uh, theories that have been put forward. Some of the earlier earliest theories is that people were sort of making clay containers in a way that was analogous to the way they made basketry. And this was noted even as early as in the 1880s. Cushing talked about how the word that they used for this coiled corrugated pottery was essentially analogous to a word for coiled earthen basket. So th this, is, this is one of the things that he talked about at the time. Um, one of the other things that has been realized a little bit more recently with some technological studies that have happened is that you know by corrugating the exterior of these vessels, you actually are giving it more surface area on the outside than on the inside which is a really good thing if you want to heat things evenly, if you want to sort of heat vessels evenly. And some, there's been some experimental work that's shown that pots that have this surface treatment um, boil over considerably less often, which you can think that's a waste of food, a waste of fuel, you know, and they also break from the stress fractures of heating and cooling a lot more slowly than vessels that have that smooth surface. So, th so there's some technological reasons also why, pe why people might have been leaving the coils exposed on these corrugated vessels. So uh, if, you, if you look again at the map on the right-hand side of page one, I have the distributions of grayware, what's known as Cibola grayware, and muggy on brownware pottery across the region. And you know we have that Anasazi muggy on division on, on the map to, to, the, to the left. And this is basically the same line. You can see the areas that are characterized mostly by brownware areas that are characterized mostly by grayware. And the thing that I wanted to show is there's really not a whole lot of a transition. It's a pretty hard break. There's a few sites that do have sort of a mix, but for the most part, this is a pretty hard break between these areas. And for a long time, um, archeologists in the region were like, well, this is a cultural boundary. You know, this is a boundary between the people making grayware, the people making brownware. So this, this hard line is a cultural boundary. But the interesting thing is, is that if you actually look at geological features in the landscape, and where you can find clay to make grayware pottery or brownware pottery, it also pretty much lines up with that, not, not perfectly. But there's reason to believe that geology may also play a major role in this. So, so my argument is that we can't just stop with that, and we have to sort of take it one step further by looking at the really specific technological attributes of, of this corrugated pottery across the region. So that's where some of my dissertation research picked up. So, you know, the, the distinctions that are shown on this map are clay color, uh, the, the temper, the kinds of materials that are put in the clay to produce them. But one thing that people noticed back as early as the, the 19 teens, uh, and, and even po possibly earlier than that, was that there's these types that people identify within this brownware and grayware. So specific kinds of surface treatments. You saw those indentations, and you, sometimes those will be done in zones. Sometimes they'll be done with patterns. Sometimes they'll be done in, with a tool rather than a finger. And people notice that a lot of these type categories that we're creating actually span both of these wares. You know, they're, they're, you find these same types across both of these. So there's, there's really something going on there that we need to investigate further. So what, the way I picked up on this is by working with people like John Olson and observing him and making my own pitiful and terrible experimental vessels. 
I learned a lot about, you know, what are real differences in corrugated pottery that we can observe in the, in the finished product that relate to these things, like how was the hand held? Were they, were they holding their thumb down and pushing indentations from the top of the coil, or were they holding the vessel upright and pushing the indentations through the bottom of the coil? You know, you end up with a finished product that doesn't look terribly different if you do these different things, but that's a very different motor skill. And you know, so th this could suggest that people are learning to make pottery in different contexts. So what I did is I developed a whole series of variables that could be measured or coded on ceramic vessels. There were 22 variables in all in the end. And, and I, I got a large sample of about 2,500 uh, whole vessels or large uh, sherds from 30 excavated sites across the region. So that's sort of the sample that I was looking at. And if, if you look at the map on page two, all those red dots are my sites uh, where I had excavated collections and can, it can compare the corrugated pottery across these regions. And, you know, so I, the kinds of variables that I was measuring included things like how thick were the coils in the vessel, how deep were the indentations, was the hand held perpendicular to the coil or, or, or parallel to the coil. Uh, there's, there's a surface treatment called smudging that's common in certain portions of the region where they're actually adding a carbon layer to the inside on this really well smooth polished surface that gives it a nice sheen. So there's all these different attributes uh, that may vary, in, including things like the, the size and shape of the vessel, what the vessel forms are, bowls versus large jars versus small jars. So measuring all these different things, um, I, I wanted to get an idea of what the differences were uh, between different portions of the region, especially in relation to that brownware and grayware divide that you guys see on the map there. And the, you know, I want to I take a step back here for a second now and talk about how these kinds of things that I'm talking about might relate to food and cooking, because that's sort of how I advertised this at the beginning. You know, that's what these things relate to. So there, there's a number of possibilities, and we don't always ha know exactly what these differences may represent in the sort of way they're used, but we, we, can, we can come up with some ideas. For example, the thickness of the vessel walls, the size of the coils, and uh, to some extent, the shapes of the rims of vessels can all in, in influence how quickly or evenly foods inside them can be heated. So, you know, for something like a stew, you want sort of a low, slow heat if you're gonna be cooking something like that. So you want something that does have that uh, property of cooking very evenly and those indentations and corrugations can help like that. If, if you wanna apply, if you wanna save fuel wood by cooking something faster at a hotter, hotter temperature, you may want thinner and smoother vessel walls. So that's just one example. Uh, the smudging that I just described, so the, the addition of that carbon layer um, on the vessels is also a really interesting one too, because people have argued that that might have uh, uh, slowed the growth of bacteria on things inside vessels. And you know, even if people don't have a concept of bacteria, there may be some sort of advantages to that. And one of the things that people have talked about in relation to that is that might suggest a different scheduling of cooking and eating. So if you're maybe, because the, these smudged vessels are almost all bowls, so they're not necessarily the things that people are being, that people are cooking in, but they're things that people are storing and serving. And, and if you're cooking one large meal a day and then s storing it over the course of the day, you know, you might want to have something like that where it's keeping it from permeating into the vessel walls and things like that. So these are just a few of the examples of what uh, some of these things might look like, that what we can learn by, by measuring these attributes and what kinds of differences in the food system they may relate to. So in order to, I, I've got all this information, I've got all these variables, and then you know, the next question is, what do you do with this? You've got all these different things, and how do you compare across all those things at once? And luckily for me, um, there's some really well-developed methods for doing these kinds of comparisons in biology. So biologists often want to know, you know, how closely related is this species to this other thing that may be, you know, even is, is a hybrid, especially in the case of plants. It may be hybrids between the two. And a lot of times the information they have are, you know, measurements of leaves and the number of spines on the ends, uh, ends of things, for example. And so they developed this whole series of methods on how you can define groups in that, uh, using that kind of information. So what I did is I took all these different attributes and things and, that I measured and coded for all this corrugated ceramics and I defined a series of groups. And if you look at this map on page two, those little pie charts there are the distributions of the 10 groups that I defined uh, from my sample of ceramic vessels kind of grouped into some subregions for the pur purpose of this um, display here. And as you can see, you know, if you just sort of glance at this, you can see that certain colors on the pie chart are a little bit more common in some areas, a little bit less common in other areas. Areas to the south are typically a little bit more diverse. They have more of these different categories. 
So you can see just by looking at this map, you know, right away, this visual representation gives you a good idea of what may be going on. And one of the things that I kind of found somewhat surprising in this is that I was expecting to see, you know, that hard break again between the sort of brownware and grayware areas, but there's actually a lot more of a gradual change across that region than I was expecting. And that, that was sort of interesting to me. And, you know, I wanted to take that a little bit further because the, the, the next idea is that, well, is, the, is that gradual uh, change just because people in that middle area are sort of using, you know, both brownware and grayware vessels in varying proportions, and that's why they have sort of a variable uh, assemblage of ceramics. But when you actually start looking closely at the attributes of these vessels, you'll see, especially in that middle zone, but kind of between St. John's and also up over to the Petrified Forest area and in uh, some areas around there, you actually see vessels that are made in a brown paste. They're brownware, technically, but, but in almost every way, they're made and produced just like the typical grayware vessels from areas further to the north. And you also have the reverse. So sometimes you'll have vessels that are made with a gray firing clay. It's the Siebel grayware paste, but they're almost in every way a brownware. And sort of the techniques people are using and the way they're being applied, they're, you know, they're very typical of areas further to the south. And there's actually... Uh, even vessels that sort of are, especially when you have the whole vessel, you can tell they really are just a combination of those attributes. So things to the north, things to the south are, are really being blended in a real way there. You know, and, and if we think about, you know, these things all relating to food systems, food technology, what does that say about, you know, these people from these different traditions? Are they coming together and actually creating something new? Or are they sort of hybridizing, you know, techniques for pottery production? What might that, what might that say about cultural relationships between people. So, you know, this, this is sort of an interesting, um, an interesting uh, aspect of this. And, you know, as I'd said, I'd kind of expected there to be this spatial relationship uh, where, you know, you'd see a hard line between people doing things one way and people doing things another way. And, you know, I, I don't really see that. I see, that. I see a much more gradual change. And when you look just from site to site, I can compare the ceramics at one site to the ceramics of every other site, and I know where they are in the landscape, so I know how far apart they are from each other. So I, I can compare how similar things are to things that at varying distances from, from, from each site. And what I see there is, so if you look at the distances between sites and the way they're making pottery, what you actually see is that, in general, people are making pottery very much like their closest neighbors, which perhaps not surprising. You know, the, the, this is something that, uh, you know, I, I talked about 90% of things being found in the general locations where they're made. But this suggests that these learning traditions are really, really lasting a long time and people are sticking to the, you know, techniques they're using and learning originally. But the fascinating thing about this is, you know, I, I described, I kind of, at the beginning of this talk, described that Pueblo 3 to Pueblo 4 transition, this massive social upheaval. You know, this was a huge, huge thing and people were moving across the landscape at, at, at perhaps very long distances. You know, that, that, that's the general way to look at this. But the interesting thing is, so if you take a Pueblo 4 site, one that's at, after this transition, one of these massive Pueblos, and you compare the pottery uh, from that site to other sites across the region, again, they're very much like earlier sites in that area. So there's not a whole lot of change in technology, even across that massive population movement. So, that, so that what that suggests to me, and what I argue, is that people, this consolidation of population really isn't involving very, very long distance movement, but it's probably more short to medium distances. So people are moving in among their neighbors and people they're probably interacting with already on a, on a regular basis. So this, you know, picture of this Pueblo 3 to Pueblo 4 transition as this period of long distance migration may be a little bit more complicated than that. And it may be a little bit more locally focused in different, in different parts of the region. So th that's sort of one interesting thing. And the, the other interesting thing to any sort of analysis like this is always going to be the exceptions. You know, so what are the exceptions to the rule? If you look on the map on page two again, you can see the area labeled Mariana Mesa. So that area is physically pretty close to the uh, El Moro Valley and Pescado Basin, which are along the Zuni River. So it's kind of, the, it's the southeastern uh, bubble on the map here. And what we see when we look at decorated pottery is that they're exchanging decorated pottery with people to the north along the Zuni River, River Valley quite, quite frequently. They're receiving quite a bit of it, and actually a lot of it's going back in return. Have you ever been to El Moro National Monument? That's one of the places that's involved in this. And this is near the town of Quemado, New Mexico, if people know the area. So, you know, in terms of this decorated pottery, they're exchanging things with, with their near neighbors to the north. 
And those are the, those are the group, that's the largest concentration of po population close to them. But when I look at the technology of the cooking pots, the storage pots that are making, it's nothing like those pots. It's, it's very much like things much further to the south, much further to the west. In areas like Silver Creek, uh, in areas out Snowflake area near Vernon, Arizona, down south in the Mogollon Highlands near Reserve and places like that. So this, this area, you know, they're not making pottery much like their, their nearest neighbor. So that's, that's, that's really different. And the thing that's interesting about that is there's all these other lines of evidence that suggest that those people might have been relative newcomers to the area at this time. So they might have been migrants that came from some of those areas. And there, there's a number of different lines of evidence that suggest that including uh, things like uh, ceramic design, nine local ceramic design painted on local vessels, um, certain architectural features like entry boxes that are built um, in, in rooms that are very much like things from northeastern Arizona and also a little bit later in time areas, areas to the south. Uh, adobe brick architecture, which is fascinating that there's this sort of uh, adobe brick, pre-Hispanic adobe brick architecture in the southwest that for the most part is limited to this line kind of between the petrified forest and Homolavi Pueblos over to this area, Mariana Mesa, I'm talking about. And there really is this sort of west to east line of that that's time transgressive as well too. You can see it sort of move through time across this region. So there's all these lines of evidence that suggest, you know, these people might not have been local to this region and they're bringing this ceramic tradition, you know, with them. And again, you know, linking this back to food, does this suggest, you know, cooking like back home? You know, this is sort of like their regional, the, the tools they need for their regional cuisine and, and the, their food system they're bringing with them. So that's, you know, I always think the exceptions to these kind of things can some, in some ways be the more interesting part. So then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, one more thing, what, what did change? You know, I talked about all that continuity across, and technology across that Pueblo three to Pueblo four transition. People's lives are changing dramatically, but they're sticking, they're sticking to things, you know, that they know in terms of like this food system. But, but what did change uh, across that? And one of the major things that did change is the social context in which they're eating and serving food. And uh, if, if you look at the bottom of page two, I have a series of nice, really beautiful painted vessels. You can see these, these beautiful painted vessels on here. And what, what these vessels all have in common, there's three different wares. We have St. John's polychrome on the left, a kind of strange uh, Heshetuthla polychrome in the middle, and then a Pinedale polychrome vessel. So those are the three sort of archaeological type names for those, and they're, and they're all related, and they have sort of a common origin in similar technology. Uh, but one, one of the things these all have in common is these designs painted on their exteriors, you know. So even, even if the, these bowls were full of food, you'd still see this design on the outside. And in 2007, uh, Barbara Mills uh, at the University of Arizona wrote an article where she actually tracked the size of these designs on the outside of vessels in relation to the size of public spaces at sites where they're found. So what she found is that when people were living in sites with very open and large public spaces, they were painting very large designs in their pots. When people were living in much more sort of tighter context with much smaller plazas, for example, they're painting much smaller designs. And that actually fluctuates through time and those two things track really well together. So she noticed this in the Silver Creek region uh, in 2007, published, published on that. And in my own dissertation research, I looked for this pattern across the broader uh, Siebler region. I found exactly the same thing. So w when you have a time period marked by uh, really, really open public spaces that are not sort of bounded areas, people tend to paint these really big designs on the, on the vessels that take up almost the entire side of the vessel. Later in time, when they're more restricted spaces, they're painting much smaller designs. So that really suggests that people are really fundamentally concerned with who's going to see them and how they're going to see these designs. It's just they're really, really interested in the public aspects of this. Another thing that's interesting about these uh, painted bowls is during the Pueblo III period, they basically come in two sizes. So you have these kind of little ones, something about like that. You can imagine, you know, what you might eat a, eat a meal out of, about, you know, a few, like a, just about if you put your hands apart like that, that's about how big they are. And then if uh, at the same time, there's another category of bowls that are much bigger things about like this, you know, so th those are probably not for one person unless you're quite hungry at the time, you know, you're not going to, you could just take a ladle and scoop it right up, but, um, th so there's these two sizes of these serving vessels, and these are used for serving and eating, you know, so there's two sizes of serving, so that might suggest, you know, maybe the family pot, and then everybody has their own little sort of individual thing like that, and at the same time, what we see, if we look at the sizes of cooking vessels at the same time during the Pueblo III period, 
There's one, basically one size, relatively small cooking pots, the kinds of things that people would cook for a household, for a family, you know? So what this suggests, because we have all this evidence that these things are being used in public, is people have argued that this might be sort of a potluck kind of thing, where people are cooking and bringing food in these large vessels and then eating them uh, in, in these, these smaller ones. And you know, this is the time period when I'm talking about where people are living near each other, but they're all off in their own space. You know, they have their own little structures and things like that. And this changes really dramatically uh, across the Pueblo Four period. So what we see at the Pueblo Four period uh, is basically there's only the small bowls. We don't really have the big bowls anymore uh, in this region. That's different than a lot of other portions of the Southwest at this time. So for the most part, we have just these small kind of bowls. But if we look at cooking jars, all of a sudden there's the little cooking jars that kind of are household size things. And then there's these big, massive cooking jars. So what, what that really suggests is people may be cooking together now. So they're cooking for larger groups of people. So rather than sort of a potluck, they're actually coming together and cooking a meal together. You know, and this, this is that time period when they're living in these massive pueblos. You know, they've got a bunch of neighbors right next to them. And that's a new thing to them. So this is sort of one of the ways that people are adapting and, and doing at this time. So I think, you know, by looking at all these different aspects of the technology of, of corrugated pottery as the food system and also how they're serving and eating, we can really say quite a bit about the social changes that people were experiencing across this time period. So thank you. I'll take questions. Thank, thank you, Matt. And I've got a microphone, so if you've got a question, uh, I'll run to you with this friendly mic, and you can oh, right up here in the front. Well, when you visit the Pueblo, an abandoned Pueblo, you're really struck by all the pottery shards. It just litters the place. Mm -hmm. Are these things that fragile? Well, Are they just breaking all the time? Or? Yeah, actually, so, so the cooking pots that I'm talking about, because they're constantly being exposed to heating, repeated heating, they actually break at a fairly predictable rate. So, you know, these, these things are breaking because you're filling them with water or, you know, other sorts of corn mush and things like that and boiling them again and again and again. And they break at a fairly consistent rate. And this is something that archaeologists actually use to estimate the duration of occupation of sites. So if you know basically what the breakage rate is, about this many vessels tend to break per year. This is about how many vessels people have at a given time. You can estimate how long a site might have been occupied, you know. You can, you can tell if something was occupied for 10 years or 50 years, for example. So they have the density of shards mm -hmm. unit surface area? Yeah, so, so a lot of times the way that'll be done is that they'll, they'll, excavate, they'll excavate a number of you know, one by one meter units, count all the broken ceramic, ceramic vessel shards in, in, inside e each of those, and then you know, be able to estimate how long the Pueblo might have been occupied using that. And, and you know, the serving vessels, the painted vessels, some of these are quite large, and, and oftentimes you, know, you can find them like pot breaks out on the surface. So you can just imagine someone you know, stubbing their toe on a rock and dropping it, and it busts, and you know, they probably cursed all kinds of stuff. And, <laughs> You know, so I mean, they are fragile enough that they do break at a relatively complete rate. But actually, if, if you look at the, the shards that were being passed around before, you can see one that had a little hole drilled in it. That's what we call a mend hole. So sometimes if it'll have a crack down one side, you can drill two holes and actually mend it and keep that crack from spreading and opening up. So they, they, had, they had some ways to do it. And they also use broken vessels for all kinds of things, too. They're not done with it when it breaks. So. Uh, have you done any residue studies on the pots? And if so, is there a difference between the brown and the grayware uh, residues? Uh, I haven't done that. There's another person that's done that. And I, and, and I, I'm, I don't remember the name, so I'm not going to say specifically. But the results were essentially inconclusive. Because when you're, when you're doing a lot of these uh, residue analyses, you have to know what you're looking for. You have to test for certain things. And if you don't know the signature of what it is you're, you're going to find, you can't necessarily identify it. So th this is an area of growth for archaeology. I think there's, there's going to be a lot of this that's going to happen. And you know, everybody probably heard about the chocolate and the, and the cylinder vessels at Chaco Canyon, you know, which was quite an amazing thing. And people were really excited about this. And you know, that requires a special kind of collection. It has, to, it has to have not been sort of exposed to all the washing and things that, that happen to archaeological collections when they come back from the field. And also, you have to know what you're looking for. They went looking for that. So I, I think this is definitely a growth area and something that we're going to see quite a bit of in the future. Is there another question? Right here. Here. What, uh, yeah, what ecological factors were occurring at that time in terms of climate mm -hmm. um, that would have caused the people to choose to live in a more Pueblo style? So she was asking, just for the camera, she was asking what environmental factors may have played into that transition and why people were living in these massive Pueblos at the time. Um, one of the things that happens at about this time, so 
the Cibola region, basically, you can imagine from the southwest corner to the northeast corner is increasing in elevation as you're going up towards the Zuni, Zuni uh, Mountains. And the further you go towards the mountains, it rains more, but it's also colder. So there's this sort of balance. If you're a corn agriculturalist, you, you need both the long enough summer and you need the, the water. So the period of time when people are really rushing into this area, there's, there's sort of a big population shift towards the Elmora Valley, is an area that's particularly warm and particularly dry. So being in an area that's a little bit cooler is maybe OK, and being in an area that is wetter is quite desirable. So there's, there's a lot of things that are pushing people in there. And one argument that people have made is that actually by you know, that packing a population that was happening led to the formation of community boundaries that sort of led to the creation of these massive pueblos. So that, that's one idea. Other people have put forth ideas related to you know, fear of war and things like that. Because this is also a period, a period of time where areas like the Four Corners are emptying out at the same time. And there's, there's not a lot of direct evidence of people from that area entering the Zuni region especially. But they may have been worried about that. They may have been seeing you know, people leaving. And they may have been passing through this area. So there's a number of different things that may relate to that. Um, one other thing that's interesting about these big pueblos that I didn't really mention is that not only are these things you know, massive, but most of them have a single unbroken wall along the outside. So they're built basically at once. You, know? you can imagine the scale of cooperation that, that takes suggest that these people already probably were some kind of social unit before they did that. But this, for whatever reason, they're committing to living that way at that time, so. Here's another one. Uh, we were visiting one of the Pueblos a few years ago, and I don't remember which one, but they were double firing pots. They were using twice as much wood, and they ended up with very dense pottery, which was mm -hmm. like glass. But I would assume that's a later concept. Yeah, I don't, I don't know of uh, pre-Hispanic evidence for anything like that. They, I, they could be just out of my experience, but for the most part, they're using technologies to conserve wood, like, uh, they're, like putting a kiln in a certain place where it gets a draft that keeps the fire hot and things like that. And oftentimes in the Cibola region, we don't really have the preserved kilns because a lot of times they're doing these in areas out by the riverside and things like that that are, that, you know, you go where you get the wood and you don't necessarily make them where you live. So we don't always have a lot of evidence of where they're producing the vessels, where they're firing them. One second. You've talked about similarities and differences in the pots. Um, what about the, the question of diet? Couldn't that contribute to similarities and differences? And even yeah. the same people over 100 years, as their environment changed, the diet may have changed, and that may have required changing in the pots. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. So one, one thing that's true of most of the Puebloan world is that people were overwhelmingly getting most of their calories from corn. That's, that's sort of just, that's true across the board of, of most of this area. You know, they're of course eating things like beans and squash, but a lot of the things we don't know a whole lot about are the sort of, you know, mustards and the little spice grasses and things like that, that, that have, you know, might've been used to flavor food. And those often are, are hard to preserve. And there, there's some interesting cases in different parts of the Southwest that suggest there may have been some differences between migrants and locals in certain areas in the Tonto Basin, for example, and the kinds of things they're consuming. But we don't have that, those kinds of studies yet in the, in the region that I'm talking about. But I'm, I'm certainly expecting that there would be those kinds of differences. Because we see differences in their cooking technology. I'd imagine it also has something to do with what and how much they're eating of different things. So, and just, just one example about uh, the areas between the north and the south, there's differences in where they're using rooms to store corn, sort of dry on the cob, versus places where they're actually shelling it and storing it that way. And that might suggest that it's being consumed in quite different ways as well, too. So we can see those kinds of things. And I'm, I'm certain there's, there's more. And you know, the, a paleoethnobotanist could probably tell you a lot more about some of the differences in the specific food products. But in general, you know, when I looked through pollen and macro plant fossil data, it's the same things across most, most of this region, but just in slightly different proportions. I'm wondering about differences in the, the clay content between cooking and uh, painted vessels. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that uh, micaceous pottery is particularly well known for being good cooking, you know, all the fancy restaurants in New Mexico, northern New Mexico. Have you seen a difference in, in the mica content between cooking vessels and serving vessels? So in the area that I'm working in, there's not a whole lot of mica in general. Yeah. So, so, well, there, there is, but not, not in the clays they're using for ceramics. So the brownware pottery that I'm talking about, a lot of that are clays that come from sort of river basin areas, alluvial clays. And the grayware pottery, a lot of it is weathering from the sort of mesas, the big sandstone mesas you can see. 
so they're getting their clay in different sorts of places. And in terms of cooking versus you know, these other decorated pots, the clays they're using, that's actually interesting because in the northern portion of the region, if you look at the chemical signatures of cooking, uh, cooking vessels and decorated vessels, they're very much used, built on the same pace. So you, know, you take away the slip, you take away all that external stuff. A lot of the, the core of you know, the clay, the initial clay they're making is very, very similar and often you know, forms these tight little groups. In areas to the south, they're sort of selecting different clays for making their cooking vessels and the ones they're making for decorated pots. So that suggests that, you know, again, that's a little bit different strategy. So there's, there's all kinds of nuances to this that are really interesting. Do you see evidence that over time the characteristics of the pots evolve in such a way to suggest uh, optimizing them for functionality and so forth? Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of work on this because the, um, especially in the four corners. A lot of this is in the Mesa Verde area where a lot of this work's been done, but these changes in vessels kind of characterize the whole Southwest at various points in time, or the Northern Southwest. So the earliest vessels are these, are these planeware things. You know, they have plain sides. They're not corrugating them like, like the ones I'm talking about now. A little bit later in time, there's these vessels that have very wide mouths and corrugated necks, but then the bases will be plain. And you know, that's sort of a trade-off because you're still able to get a lot of heat efficiency and heat things really well, but you're also sort of getting some of the benefits of having the increased surface area. A little bit later in time, after about 1050, people are corrugating things all over the vessel. So, you know, again, again, that's changing. And again, changing the characteristics of the heat load and also how long a vessel will last. Those vessels end up lasting longer because uh, they're able to withstand heat shock a little bit better. And then the interesting thing is, is towards the end of the sequence, especially after 80, 1300 in some places and a little bit later, at the end, they start what's called obliterating the coils. So they're sort of wiping while the clay is still leather hard or maybe even a little bit wetter and smoothing out some of the edges. So you still see the little bits of the indentations that were there previously, but they're wiping a lot of that away. And then, you know, Zuni Pueblo, they're in the protohistoric period after about 1400, they're making what's known as blackware, which is this just can entirely smooth uh, black black blackish uh, surface vessel. So they're actually going away from the corrugation at the very end of the sequence. And that, that's sort of a pattern that plays out in a lot of different places. So there's been a lot of speculation on why people are going back to this. And one thing is that they're processing corn a lot more thoroughly at that time, so they might not need the sort of long cooking times, and they might be okay with sort of cooking things in a shorter period of time at higher temperatures. And other people, uh, especially involving folks that were migrating out of the northern southwest and then ending up in the Rio Grande, for example, people have suggested that they might have been you know, overtly rejecting things that had that were tied to that earlier past. So, so, so people have made both ideological and technological arguments for why that change has taken place. Another question. So, Matt, just uh, yeah, can you tell us about solving the big thumb problem? How does the big thumb How problem? does the skill <laughs> yeah. come into it, and how do those coils stay together if they're you know so evident still? Yeah, and the the so so. You know, if you look at those shirts that I passed around, there are pretty tiny indentations in some of those. And one of the things that I always thought was you can often see fingerprints in those indentations. And in the area that I knew the best at the time, they, they were pushing down probably with a thumb or a finger, and you could always just see exactly where the finger had been applied to the coil. You know, I was expecting that that's basically how people were doing it. But then by looking at these other potters that are a lot more skilled at this than me, what they actually will do is wipe their finger through, and they're using just the side of their thumb. So it's not actually even leaving an impression and they're just barely touching the side of the vessel and they're actually fusing the coil with one finger and kind of rolling like that. And they put another coil just very, very much overlapping on top of that. So you're, you're left with these very, very fine coils with these very small indentations and it's just all about the skill. And like I said, you know, there, there's been a number of studies on how long it takes to make planeware versus corrugated vessels. And some people have argued that planeware vessels take more time because you have to smooth them. Other people have argued that corrugated vessels take more time because it's just you know, a different process, but it really turns out just to have a lot to do with the skill of the potter because a skilled potter can, can make a vessel just like you know, you're, they're just doing it at that speed. I'm, that's not even an exaggeration, just going around the coils like this and build, building it up, and it, it's really quite impressive. So I think you know, this has everything to do with skill, and it, it's, it's not really about you know, having tiny fingers to make those indentations. It's just knowing what you're doing. So. Here's another. I was just wondering what uh, some other uses of pottery was, uh, or pots. 
rather than just cooking and so on. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of you know bulk storage kinds of things you can imagine. You, can, you often see large jars with some quite restricted and small necks that are used for storing things over the long term. Um, they're, you know, use, again, used for serving. And there's even evidence in different parts of the Southwest that they were sort of displayed and things like that. For, there was a really interesting study, I thought, uh, done by Scott Van Kieran and some colleagues um, looking at what's called four-mile polychrome, which is a really, really beautiful polychrome uh, vessel. And they looked at the wear on different parts of the vessel and found that they were actually probably sitting, like facing out with the design facing out towards a room. So they're displaying them with the bottom touching a surface and the back touching a surface like that. So, like, you know, art objects even, you know, you, you, you can think of that. And, you know, even after a vessel breaks, it's not, they're not done with it. They're, they're not out of the system. And w one thing that I always find interesting, especially if you're working in kind of the uh, little Colorado area around uh, uh, petrified forests or places like that, out on the dunes, the sand dunes, people are farming those dunes. And you often, in areas that were likely farmland, find big bits of broken jars relatively evenly spaced across large areas. You know, that sort of fascinated me for a long time. I was like, what is this? Why are we seeing this again and again? And sometimes there'll be slabs of stone. And it turns out there's sort of an ethnographic analog for this at Hopi, where people are using broken bits of jars to, sh to shield young corn plants from the wind. So, so there's all kinds of things. You know, they're very innovative when it comes to using both, you know, the completed and broken vessels. So. Thank you very much, Matt. And we'll be back a month from now when uh, someone I know well, Linda Mayro, who happens to be my wife um, and works for Pima County, and Julia Fonseca are here talking about the, the success of, of the Pima County uh, Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan uh, 10 years after its initiation. And for, if you aren't a current member of Archaeology Southwest, uh, we're a nonprofit. We put this on uh, and as a public service. And if, you're, if you don't have um, the membership information, it's out on the, the uh, desk behind me. And also, the ceramics that went around, if you want to take another look at those, uh, they're right next to the membership information. So uh, thank you all for coming tonight. And we'll be back in a month. And thank you, Matt, very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.